Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we're very pleased to have with us this afternoon, veteran journalist Linda Greenhouse, here to talk with fellow journalist Emily Bazelon about Linda's insightful new book on the current Supreme Court, Justice on the Brink. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. Uh, to post a question at uh, any point during the discussion, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Justice on the Brink. Uh, Linda's book has a long subtitle. It says, The Death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, The Rise of Amy Conant Barrett, and 12 Months That Transformed the Supreme Court. That pretty much captures the book's timeline which runs from mid-2020 to mid-2021. As Linda explains in her engrossing, instructive, perceptive narrative, that year marked a watershed during which the new supermajority of conservative justices took hold and the court approached the brink of a profound lurch rightward. Linda observes in her epilogue that this initial year was not quite the term conservatives had hoped for, nor the term liberals had most feared. But as she makes clear uh, in the book, enough happened to indicate that the efforts at consensus building pursued for a decade and a half by Chief Justice John Roberts will have a much harder time now with the Roberts court poised to transform effectively into the Trump court. Here's what Publishers Weekly in a rave review said of the book, distinguished by vivid profiles of the justices and lucid unraveling of their knotty legal theories this is a revelatory study of the Supreme Court influx. Linda, of course, is a renowned authority on the court, which she covered for the New York Times for nearly three decades, from 1978 to 2008, uh, with a, a, a brief uh, a break uh, in the mid-1980s when she reported on Congress. And along the way, Linda won a number of major awards, including a Pulitzer for beat reporting. She is, as a Times article said of her the other day, the acknowledged dean of living Supreme Court journalists. Nowadays, she writes an opinion column on law for the Times and also teaches at Yale Law School. Her previous books include a biography of Justice Harry Blackman and works on the abortion debate, the rise of the judicial right, and her reflections as a journalist, plus a concise introduction on the Supreme Court published by Oxford University Press. Um, as I said at the outset, uh, Linda will be in, in conversation with Emily Bazelon, a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine and a research fellow at Yale Law School. She's also the author of two bestsellers, Sticks and Stones about the culture of bullying and Charged about mass incarceration and flaws in the criminal justice system. And she co-hosts Slate's popular weekly podcast, Political Gap Fest. So uh, Linda and Emily... Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, lovely introduction. And thank you to Politics and Prose um, for hosting this event. Linda is one of the best people in the whole world to talk about the Supreme Court with. She's also just incredibly menchy person who has taught me a lot about how to be a good human being and especially about how to be a good feminist um, by being such an excellent mentor and uh and so generous to so many other people, including um, up and coming journalists. So I am really excited for this conversation. Um, Linda, I wanted to start by setting the table about just how much the Supreme Court has changed in the last few years. We have three uh, appointees from President Trump, um, uh, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, and Barrett and Kavanaugh have come in the last few years. What happens to the Supreme Court when the personnel changes to this to such a degree? Is it an organism that has to really reconstitute itself when a third of its members change? Well, there's a, there's a sense in which it reconstitutes itself when even one new justice comes in. Justice Byron White, who served for well over 30 years, famously said, every time a new justice comes, it's a new court. And so that is just true in spades, because one thing in addition to the, the raw numbers, the three appointees of President Trump in 
four years. And of course, uh, President Obama only had two appointees in, in eight years. Um, and President Clinton also had two appointees in eight years. Uh, it, it, the political atmosphere surrounding these nominations and, and confirmations has been so toxic, so intense, that in no way could this feel like business as usual. Before we go on, I have to push back, Emily, against your the hyperbole in your in your very nice introduction. And and also um to to Bradley's because um I don't think I am in any way the dean of the Supreme Court Press Corps. For one thing, I'm not in the Supreme Court Press Corps anymore. Um, and I would happily cede that title to my friend Nina Totenberg. But anyway, oh, we got We'll go on with our conversation. Good that we got that on the record. <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about the particular dynamics going into the 2020-21 term? So this is a little more than a year ago. Um, Justice Ginsburg um, died in September. Then we have a very quick uh, confirmation process for Justice Barrett. And how does that transform what's happening? Which are the cases that become the kind of initial bellwethers for what that kind of shift is going to augur for the court? Well, as, as people know, the court begins a new term on the first Monday in October, but actually the court begins its work a week ahead of that. They get together to go over all the hundreds of cases that have piled up, new petitions that have piled up over the summer. So Ruth Ginsburg's death on September 18th was you know, just really at the threshold of the new term. And then uh, President Trump's nomination of Amy Barrett came so quickly, uh, Ruth Ginsburg hadn't been buried yet. It was just head snapping. And of course, the, the November election was looming. Millions of Americans had already voted in states that had early voting. So it was a collision of this unanticipated Supreme Court vacancy, this unanticipated rush to fill it, and the election. So it was just, there, there's no analog to, to what that fall of 2020 was like from a Supreme Court point of view. And in terms of the cases, when did we start to see a real shift in the outcome or in the reasoning? What were the first signs that um, the switch from Justice Ginsburg to Justice Barrett was going to make the difference? Well, the first sign, it was a major one, a very telling one, and it came within a couple of weeks of Justice Barrett being seated. It was the Thanksgiving Eve order on, we can discuss this, the shadow docket uh, came down that um, blocked New York's regulation that had limited attendance, in-person attendance at a variety of venues, including uh, houses of worship. What made that so uh, telling is that these challenges by uh, religious institutions to the COVID capacity limitations that various jurisdictions were, were putting on all kinds of venues had started coming up in the late spring and summer of 2020. And the court had rejected these challenges uh, Chief Justice Roberts writing that, you know, it wasn't the role of federal judges to second guess public health experts in the middle of a public health emergency. Those votes were by five to four, the four justices to the Chief Justice's right dissented, uh, but the, the regulations were not blocked. So Justice Barrett in for Justice Ginsburg, the votes flipped five to four, the New York regulation was uh, and joined, and that continued as the term went on, leading up to uh, really a major ruling that came down on the on the shadow docket in, in a California case that, at least in my view, really um, made law made made new law about the privileged position of religion as against all other activities. Um, so we saw right away that this there was going to be something different. And when you say made law, I mean, obviously, this is what the Supreme Court does. It makes law. But I think you were talking about a distinction of making law through the shadow docket, um, which is the docket for emergency orders. What's the significance of the court making law in that particular um, forum? Well, in the ordinary course of events, when the court agrees to hear a case, 
uh, for instance, the Mississippi abortion case that's going to hear on December 1st, you know, it announces that we've granted this case. And that means uh, people file briefs, friends of the court briefs come in. Uh, the argument's going to be held in the full glare of public attention. Not that the public is allowed into the court these days, but it'll be live streamed. Uh, you know, the transcript will go up uh, right away and all the briefs are up online and all that kind of thing. So in a way, the, the public is kind of invited into the, the discourse that surrounds a major case. And, uh, you know, not literally, obviously, but, but it becomes a, a public conversation. The California case that I just referred to that I said made law, uh, you know, came up and was disposed of within a couple of days without any prior announcement. And, uh, and, and actually, as I say, ended up, uh, re religion ended up in a position of privilege that in my view anyway, it had not previously had in our constitutional system. I'll, I'll explain why. So this California regulation said that in, in a home, there could be no gathering greater than three unrelated households. So three couples for whatever, for a birthday party, for a sit down dinner or for worship. So two individuals who use their homes for religious purposes um, sued and they said, this is discrimination against religion. The lower courts said, no, it's not because religion isn't being singled out. You can't use your home with more than three households for any purpose. So like, where's the discrimination? The Supreme Court uh, rejected that analysis and said, well, because more people are allowed in the shopping mall or this place and that place, it is discrimination. And that any time that any place and that any non-religious activity is treated better than any religious activity, that violates the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Uh, as long as we're talking about, quote, comparable, event, comparable settings, then of course, they weren't comparable, but this, the majority deemed them to be comparable. They said so. And that's where we ended up with that case. So previously you were explaining that when Justice Ginsburg had this, the seat that Justice Barrett now occupies, previous COVID health, public health measures cases came out the opposite way. Is there a way to distinguish those previous cases from this latter ruling in California? In other words, could you imagine a kind of neutral rule of law based way of justifying this change in votes? Or are we merely just talking about a shift in personnel? No, there's no way to distinguish them. I mean, I go into this in, in, in the book, actually, in a lot of detail, because um, it struck me as the term went on that, that religion really was the story to tell. And if anything, uh, this California order, the case, by the way, is called Tandon against Newsom. The, the California order was less problematic than anything else because uh, in earlier cases, uh, there was a case from, from Nevada in which Justice Alito had said uh, in dissent, um, well, you can go to gamble, but you can't go to pray, something like that. Uh, here it was, you can't do anything in your home with more than three households. There was no distinction as to what kind of event could take place. And so the notion that there was any kind of discrimination was just, I, I find it hard to articulate it because it didn't make any sense to me, nor did it make any sense to the lower courts. Um, so, uh, so no, it was simply the, the change in personnel. There's no doubt about that. So one of the reasons I was asking about this is that the question of the court's position as a separate branch of government, its legitimacy, its public approval rating is all very much in play. Um, the poll numbers show that there's been a significant drop in public approval of the court in the last, um, I think, year and a half. Maybe it's a little longer now. And the justices have really pushed back on this. Um, Justice Breyer has a recent book in which he's talked about how it's very unfair to talk about the court as a 
partisan instrument. Justice Barrett gave a speech saying that we're not political hacks. Um, Justice Alito gave a very fiery address um, in which he accused people who don't trust the court of really undermining its whole purpose. And for people who are legal realists who think that, you know, there are ways in which law is different from politics, but also a lot of overlap, um, they've been arguing for a long time that you can see this kind of realism on the court. And I wonder if you feel like they're right and you can see it more starkly now or whether you think the justices who are pushing back have you know their own very reasonable set of points to make and kind of how you assess the court as as kind of in terms of inst institutional legitimacy right now well i think to you know to justice alito and justice barrett the ones who are pushing back i would say uh, let's watch what they do not what they say uh you know in the, in, in Toward the end of the book, I use the image of the fourth wall from theater. So the fourth wall in, in you know, dramatic terms signifies that we go to see a play and we know that the, on the stage we're seeing actors, not real people, you know, who are performing from a script and they're not, it's not their real life. Uh, but, you know, it's part of our culture that we, that we understand this. Uh, and we don't, we, we and the actors choose not to break the fourth wall. I think this was a term when the fourth wall was broken because of what you have highlighted. There was no reason for changes in doctrine except changes in personnel. So what does that tell us about the role of something abstract called law in the way the current Supreme Court is behaving? And of course, we'll see this dramatically when they get around to deciding the Mississippi abortion case, I'm quite sure. Um, I just want to encourage people in the audience to put questions in now as opposed to later. It'll help me by giving me a little more time to sneak a peek at them. Um, so before we talk about the abortion case, and I also want to ask you about the important gun regulation case that was um, argued a week or so ago, I wanted to push a little bit more on the shadow docket. So um, is the shadow docket playing a particular role of its own in this question of the court's role? And, you know, you were talking before about how much more public airing and kind of discussion there is before the court rules in a normal case. Is the court using the shadow docket differently in the last year or two than it had previously? I think it is. I mean, there's obviously nothing surprising or, or wrong in any way about a court having an emergency docket, emergencies do come up, uh, but, but that's a procedural matter. And I think starting in the, in the Trump years with things like uh, the, the border wall case that, come up, that came up to the court when uh, Trump had held himself to unappropriated money to build the wall and the Supreme Court overturned an injunction and, and let that go forward. Um, you know, I think we, we really are seeing something different. And the, the California case, I don't want to seem like I'm obsessed with it, but, you know, was, was really an example because the regulation that was at issue there was going to expire in a few days. If the court had simply stayed its hand, it would have expired and everybody would have gone on with their life. But the majority reached out to grab it because it was a vehicle they had been looking for to make the law that they made. And if that's not an example of an abuse of the shadow docket, then I haven't seen one. And I think it's pretty, it's pretty telling. Can you also talk a little bit about the Texas abortion law, SB8, which is this near ban on abortion um, very early in the first trimester at six weeks? Um, it's a law that uh, was written essentially to try to evade judicial review. Um, because it's a law that allows only for private enforcement, um, this so-called bounty hunting, where someone who thinks an Ill illegal abortion has been performed can then sue the provider, can, can sue anyone who um, supposedly aided with the abortion, including the Uber driver who drove a patient to the clinic. Because of this private enforcement mechanism, um, the Supreme Court said that it could not, or it refused to stay the law, to enjoin the law from going into effect. And that all happened on the shadow docket as an emergency order. And I wonder what you thought of the handling of that case and whether this um, 
private enforcement mechanism truly should have evaded, meant that um, it evaded federal court review. Yeah, I was pretty shocked. This was what happened on September 1st. The court was not yet in session, of course. Um, and the court refused to issue a stay, as you said, of the of the law taking effect. And what what shocked me about it was they already had the Mississippi case on their docket. And the question in the Mississippi case is, can a state outlaw abortion before fetal viability, before the fetus is viable? That's basically, aside from the weird vigilante aspect of the Texas law, that's at the heart of the Texas law. Can Texas outlaw abortion before fetal viability? So typically what we see when something like that happens, when case number one has been granted and is on the verge of argument and decision, case number two that raises a related question comes along, the court will issue a stay and put the case on hold so that it can eventually be handled in light of whatever they're going to decide in case number one. I mean, that's pretty standard. And yet the court over the dissenting votes of the chief justice and, and the, the three remaining liberals on the court um, refused to stay the law. And, and that could only have been in service of an agenda to let that law go into effect. And I'll point out the law is still in effect. More, more than two months now, it's basically shut down abortion in Texas and women are going all over the country to exercise what is still, as of tonight, a constitutional right. And I mean, maybe this is sort of a dense question, but why do this? Why prevent abortion from taking place in Texas? Not entirely, but abortions, I think the number have dropped a fewer than half that they were. Um, and most of the clinics in Texas have shut down. What's the point of doing that several months before a ruling in the Mississippi case? I don't know. You tell me. I mean, the only reason that comes to my mind is um, that's an outcome that makes them happy. I mean, the outcome was totally predictable. And, uh, you know, it, it, it takes it only takes four votes to grant a case, but it takes five votes to grant a stay. And, uh you know, there, there might have been four votes to hear the case, but they couldn't count to five to get the stay. And, and that's where we are. Um, can we talk a little bit more about some of the significant decisions that you cover um, in your book from last term? So I'm thinking particularly of a really important uh, case about the Voting Rights Act, in particular, what's called Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, you write about it at with uh, at length, but with great um, with with great insight, and so I'm just hoping you can take us through the paces of that because obviously voting rights and the whole question of whether states can make it harder for people to vote is very much on the political agenda at the moment. Yeah, this was a challenge to a couple of uh, voting measures in Arizona that were challenged as having the effect of, of voter suppression. When the case was granted early in the in the last term, you know, it didn't make many waves because, uh, you know, it just kind of seemed like another case. But then we had everything that happened during the election and, and you know, the kind of ramping up of the voter suppression machine of the Republican Party and so on. So by the time the case was argued in the early spring, it, it, it was really kind of a, a showpiece for what had become and what was going to become of the right to vote in our democracy. So this case um, involved one particular part, the, the main remaining part of the Voting Rights Act. The other main part had been invalidated functionally um, by Chief Justice Roberts' decision in 2013, the Shelby County case. That was section five that required uh, certain jurisdictions to get federal preclearance before they could make a change in their voting laws. This was section two that applies to the whole country. And it says that any um, voting measure that has the purpose or effect, it doesn't have to be intentional, the effect of um, depriving people of the right to vote on the basis of various um, characteristics um, violated, violated section two. So the claim here was that these two measures, uh, one of which 
uh, outlawed uh, what, what they what the the nasty word for it is ballot collection. Uh, people that go around with uh, picking up other people's absentee ballots, that that was uh, very had a very discriminatory effect on the vast Indian reservations in the state of Arizona because there's no public transportation, there are very few post offices, and so it's typical that uh, ballots are grouped together and taken into a post office by you know a, a person who didn't actually who, whose ballots those were were not. Uh, and the other one was a, a regulation that said that if a voter turns up in the wrong precinct and votes by mistake in the wrong precinct, all that person's votes are invalidated. Uh, even the votes for statewide offices where it shouldn't matter what precinct you happen to mistakenly vote in. And that had a discriminatory effect on uh, minority voters because the precinct lines, it, it's a fact, change a good deal more often in minority communities than in uh, majority white communities. So that it's very common that a person just simply confused about, gee, I voted here last time and they vote there, they go there again and it's the wrong precinct. So the question was what standard to use to evaluate this? And the majority opinion went to Justice Alito and he's busy telling us that um, this is all perfectly fine because when Congress passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965 and amended Section 2 in 1982, um, you know, this all would have been fine and this wasn't the kind of thing that they had in mind. And that's the what we look back at as to what would have uh, been evaluated as a, as a vote suppression measure um, for those who wrote the law. And the court, the majority just basically shrugged at the implications, the impact of the, the ruling. Justice Kagan wrote one of her, I think, most eloquent dissents of her time on the court in unpacking exactly what was the matter with this um, very uh, grudging uh, uh, interpretation of one of the jewels in the crown of the civil rights era. Um, so that's what we're left with. We have a non-functioning non section five, a weakened section two of the Voting Rights Act and one of our major political parties that seems just determined to do what they can to keep people from voting if they're the kind of people that, whose votes they are afraid they're not gonna get. So one of the kind of bigger questions about the Supreme Court and the role of government I think has to do with these voting rights questions in that if the court is not going to really safeguard the right to vote in the way that the Voting Rights Act perhaps envisioned or has it's been used in the past, and this is a court dominated by Republican nominees, is the court in effect entrenching the power of one political party or at least aiding that process as this party effectively um, does lots of gerrymandering around the country. Democrats are also gerrymandering, but they control fewer state houses and states that are super amenable to gerrymandering. Um, you have other kinds of voting rights restrictions, uh, Republican um, legislation that would also make it easier to overturn the results of a legal election in a way that President Trump wished for in November 2020. If the court is not kind of standing in the way of those kinds of moves, is there an argument that the court is kind of feeding into this um, sort of minority rule that Republicans seem to be moving toward? Well, I mean, I guess I'm not quite cynical enough to sit here and say, you know, that's why they're doing it. I'm willing to think that they are who they are and they see the Voting Rights Act as John Roberts, the young John Roberts in his first legal jobs in the Reagan administration had seen the Voting Rights Act as an impediment to what I'm really not sure, but um, you know, it's just something that was in the way, that was just a bother. Um, I mean, I, I can't sit here and say that, that you know, there's a conspiracy going on at one first street Northeast to uh, you know, empower the Republican party to do what it wants to do. That's a little extreme even for me, um, but it is extremely concerning. And, uh, you know, we know that that 
everything is ramping up for the midterms and for 2024, and there'll be um, a flood of litigation. And uh, based on the court's performance in this last year, um, it's not likely to have an outcome that is uh, helpful to our democracy. So one sign from the term that you focus on that is perhaps a more hopeful one is that there were a number of lawsuits that President Trump and his allies brought to try to involve the court in making it harder for Pennsylvania, for example, to declare Joe Biden the winner. There are these challenges of post-election litigation um, and also challenges that President Trump was bringing to uh, the efforts of federal prosecutors to get his tax records and other records for their investigations. How much stock do you put in the idea that because the court stayed its hand in those cases, that's a sign of its kind of ultimate neutrality and, and a sign of its good faith? Yeah, I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in that. I mean, I, I do spend a lot of time in, in, in the weeds of those cases uh, that came up before the election and then after the election. Uh, because I was, you know, I was writing the book in real time. And uh, of course, I didn't know how they were going to come out. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's true. Trump ended up very angry at, quote, his three justices who didn't do what he wanted them to do. But the cases that came up were handled so badly, were so, um, the, the claims were so extreme that, um, they didn't even get the votes of a, a, a Trump appointed federal appeals court judge in the third circuit who said, you know, I just can't accept these claims. Um, you know, I think if anything, what happened surrounding the election was a, a heads up to Republican lawyers or so on that, you know, you've got to do a better job and you know, you, you can't wait for the last minute and you've got to get all your ducks in a row. But I don't think it says to them, um, you know, you're really sunk and the court's never going to hear you because um, I think Justice Alito, for one, made it quite clear that if only he had had more time, he really wanted to get his hands on the Pennsylvania case, which had to do with uh, which organ of government can um, amend the laws, the, the voting laws in the, in the face of the pandemic. He was very upset about the um, expansion of the time allowed for receiving the mail-in ballots and so on, but he had to concede that it was really too late for the court to actually be able to do anything about it. So one aspect of the court that I think you and I are both really interested in is the role of um, Justice Barrett, the newest member of the court, um, you know, one of three women on the court. Um, and you write at length and in a really interesting way about her intervention in um, the case Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. This is a case in which the city had a contract with a Catholic social services agency um, for foster care services. And then it came to the city's attention that the um, Catholic agency was not accepting foster parent applications from people in same-sex marriages. And so the city said, we're not going to renew your contract. Um, the agency sued on grounds of religious freedom, essentially arguing that it was part of its religious liberty rights to be able to discriminate against these um, same-sex couples. Um, and this case seems like it's going to be this huge decision for religious freedom. And then it ends up being 9-0, but with very sharp, I think, divides in the reasoning of the justices um, and an angry opinion from Justice Alito that looks like maybe it was supposed to be the majority opinion, but then he didn't have five votes. Um, and one reason he didn't have five votes was Justice Barrett. Another reason was Justice Kavanaugh. Um, and I wonder if you can talk through a little bit about what you think was going on in this important and interesting case. Yeah, it was a fascinating case. Um, the, the basic question people were expecting the court to answer was, um, will the court overturn a case from 1990 called Employment Division Against Smith, which um, to boil that down says that when you've got a, a, a neutral, generally applicable law that doesn't single out religion, uh, you don't have a free exercise claim to an exemption from that law. 
So here was uh, Philadelphia's contracting rules that said no discrimination. And that applied to everybody and all kinds of discrimination, including uh, discrimination against uh, same-sex married couples. Um, so it seemed to present the question, the lower courts had ruled on the basis of employment division against Smith, that the, the city would, would prevail and, and the, uh, the Catholic agency didn't have a claim. The way it was decided is that Chief Justice Roberts kind of pulled a rabbit out of a hat and he said, oh, by the way, it's not a generally applicable law because uh, the contract itself provides for an exemption. And if it provides for an exemption under any circumstances, it's not generally applicable. So we don't have to get into employment division against Smith. We can just say that um, the Catholic agency wins and the city loses. The fact that this exemption had actually never been applied, had never been invoked, had never even been noticed, was kind of beside the point. So that, that's what led Alito to write this uh, you know, vigorous uh, opinion concurring in the bottom line result, but saying basically you all have wimped out and this was the time and place to do what we said we were gonna do, overturn employment division against Smith. So Justice Barrett joined by Justice Kavanaugh wrote an opinion concurring in the outcome, very short, written by her, joined by him, fascinating. And she said, you know, before we rush to replace Employment Division against Smith, we better make sure we know what we're replacing it with. And, you know, we, we need to deal with this matter with some nuance. And what I say in the book is, nuance is not a word that we've heard a lot of from conservative justices. So, you know, you can, you, you can draw two things from her opinion. One, she really is going to go slow. At least she went slow and, and it was a kind of a marker. She didn't have to write anything. She just could have joined the chief justice's opinion. She didn't have to say anything. She didn't have to respond to Alito. Why did she respond to Alito? I think it was a memo to Sam, Sam Alito, saying, you know, don't take my vote for granted even though there, we have certain things in common, we're both conservative, we're both very conservative Catholics, but my vote is my vote, it's not your vote. And, you know, just watch that space. So one of the big questions going forward is whether this is a five to four court in which uh, just Chief Justice Roberts um, is the fourth vote with the liberals and Kavanaugh, Barrett, uh, Alito, Gorsuch, and Thomas are this very solid conservative majority that's willing to go further than Chief Justice Roberts, a very conservative um, judge, but perhaps not to the same degree as the others. Another potential formulation is a kind of 313 uh, court, more in line with what you were describing in Fulton, where Chief Justice Roberts persuades Kavanaugh and Barrett to join him and a kind of fulcrum position between um, the liberals and uh, I should have said a three, three, three court um, between the liberals and then three arch conservatives. Um, and then there are other formulations where you could imagine different sort of compositions of the court in different kind of scenarios. And we don't have a sort of single narrative going forward. Um, we are used to that single narrative for a long time. Chief uh, Justice O'Connor played the role of the kind of centrist who had a lot of power. Um, then Justice Kennedy kind of succeeded her in that role. Do you think that we are going to have a court that has that same kind of person with a lot of um, power to make the determination? Or do you think that we're going to have kind of shifting alliances going forward? Yeah, I think, I think the latter. I mean, your observation is correct. You and I both teach teach in, in a law school. And, uh, you know, I think our students kind of grew up with the notion that there's a, a median justice. So of course, in a group of nine, there's always going to be a median, but there's, there's the quote, swing justice who you have to, anybody bringing a case has to say, well, you know, we've got to, we've got to get Justice Kennedy, whatever we do, we've got to get Justice Kennedy. That, I don't think that's the case anymore. When I first was covering the court, uh, before 
Justice Lewis Powell became kind of a swing justice. And then, as you said, Justice O'Connor, Justice Kennedy, there really was a group in the middle that any lawyer bringing a case would have to, it, it was not a foregone conclusion how this group was going to go. I think uh, for the current court, it's very dependent on the subject matter. Uh, you know, I think it's something like um, free exercise. I think the chief justice is is fully, I mean, totally in sync with the most conservative members of the court. This is an agenda item for him of expanding the role of free exercise. There's a, a what I consider a sort of underappreciated, but very important case on this is gonna be argued uh, next month, a case from Maine about um, parochial school tuition. And public funding, state funding of parochial school tuition. Right, right. Um, but, you know, on something like um, the administrative state, uh, we're going to see, I think, that, that that's a, an agenda item for some of the people to the Chief Justice's right. And I'm not sure he's fully on board with um, basically tearing down the post-New Deal um, structure of the executive branch. Um, so I think it, it, you know, it's really going to vary quite a lot. I want to turn to some of the audience questions. There's some great ones coming in, and I would love it if people would add more. Um, Ralph Buglis, Buglis, perhaps, is asking if you have a prediction about the Mississippi abortion case. My least favorite thing to do is predict outcomes, but I'm hoping maybe you feel differently. <laughs> well, my prediction is um, the law of abortion, as we've known it for almost half a century, is not going to emerge intact from this case. Uh, you know, in, in, in the book, I, I chronicle uh, the long period of time it, that this, that Mississippi's appeal, the, the law, of course, had been struck down by the lower courts because it's flagrantly unconstitutional under current law. The court had this under advisement for months before they finally granted the case for argument in this term. They granted it last May. And my, my May chapter, I uh, begins with the line, I, I think it is, um, it was always about abortion, right? So here we are. So they had no reason to take this case unless they wanted to do something with it because cases like this have come up before. Uh, always, these laws have always been struck down in the lower courts and not granted by the Supreme Court. So, you know, obviously there's a strong desire to do something, whether it's explicitly overturn the right to abortion or simply functionally overturn it, you know, that's, we'll see. I'm not sure there's a huge difference between those two outcomes. If at the end of the day, a woman with a non-viable fetus, a fetus before 22 or 23 weeks of pregnancy, if she cannot get the abortion that she wants, then in my opinion, there is no right to abortion. So talk a little bit more about why that's true with a 15 week ban. So in Mississippi, this is a near total ban, but it doesn't kick in until halfway through the second trimester. Something like 90% of abortions are performed in the first trimester. So we're talking about a relatively small number. Why do you feel like there would effectively be no right to abortion if women didn't have this right under the Mississippi framework? Well, for all, because for all these years, fetal viability has been the firewall that has protected the right. So before viability, um, you can put up all kinds of roadblocks and make the woman go through all kinds of nonsense. But at the end of the day, she gets the right to terminate the pregnancy. If you, if you breach that firewall, I mean, Mississippi, you know, cleverly, they have 15 weeks. Texas has six weeks. Arkansas is considering no weeks, like fertilization. And one question that justices always ask on the bench, and Chief Justice Roberts asked it just the other day, a case I was listening to, and it, you know, I, I, I perked up. He always says, what's your limiting principle? Because the court knows, decides a case today, it's making law for the future, not just this case. That's what it's all about. So it's, it's the legal regime. So, you know, once viability goes, I don't see what the stopping point is. The one thing I've been wondering about related to this is um, 
the standard the court may articulate. So as you know, we have Roe versus Wade that has this trimester framework in 1973, but then the court very importantly reaffirms Roe in Casey versus Planned Parenthood in 1992 and sets this standard, which is that the women, a woman's, a person's right to choose is subject to the undue burden standard. So in other words, states can restrict abortion up until the point they're placing an undue burden on access to this constitutional right. Do you think that the court will have to articulate a new standard? Um, and do you have any idea of what that might be? Is there some possible universe in which they could be claiming to maintain the standard of undue burden and undue burden and yet still uphold Mississippi's law? Well, I mean, as you frame the question, they could say, um, you know, a 15 week ban is not an undue burden for the, the term of art, the jargon is the large fraction of women in Mississippi who would be seeking an abortion, uh, which is true. The one clinic left in Mississippi um, only does abortions up to 16 weeks, I believe. So they see very few patients who want abortions at that stage of pregnancy. So that would be, a, I suppose, a very narrow way of uh, answering the dilemma posed by the, um, the fact that this law is flagrantly unconstitutional, but yet they want to uphold it. Um, I wouldn't take a lot of comfort in that because uh, these justices who are going to be making that ruling are going to be there for a long time. You know, they're not good. The Trump judges, justices are not going anywhere. And so the next case comes along. Oh, he said 15 weeks. And how about 12 weeks? And how about... Uh, so, uh, you know, that may look like it's buying some time, but that's all it would be doing, actually. Um, this is a question from Mark Wasserman. He says, your book was written in real time, that is month by month, and you wrote that you didn't revise any chapter in the light of later actions by the court. Is there anything you would revise in the, late, in the light of anything the court did after you finalized your book? That's a good question. So, I mean, the one that comes to my mind, and I kind of kick myself a little bit, um, if people remember the, the uh, Amy Barrett's very rapid confirmation, the issue that the Democrats were raising was the Affordable Care Act, because there was a case uh, on, on the docket for, on the schedule for argument within weeks of her coming onto the court um, that sort of had the, that at stake was the future of the Affordable Care Act and some crazy uh, argument that I won't even go into. And it was clear from the argument that the law was going to survive, uh, which I wrote uh, as I wrote about the argument. What I didn't pick up on, and when I went back later and read the transcript, I should have picked up on, was the reason it wasn't going to survive was the court was going to rule that the state of Texas didn't have standing to bring the challenge that it brought. That was there in the questions, but I was so focused on the kind of nuts and bolts of the, the structure of the law that um, the challengers were trying to peel apart that, um, that I didn't pick up on that. But as, as, uh, as Mark um, properly says, um, I, I, I wrote very honestly and I didn't go back and, and change anything to make myself look brilliant. <laughs> um. Here is another anonymous question. Do you think that uh, Minority Leader Senator Mitch McConnell could or would block a Biden nominee to the Supreme Court? Um, and do you think that Biden, that, um, that do you think Justice Breyer should retire to enable Biden to nominate a new justice? Well, of course, when McConnell blocked uh, President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland, uh, he was the majority leader. And now he's not the majority leader. He's barely not the majority leader um, with uh, Vice President Harris being able to break a tie. So the, you know, the politics are different, assuming, um, you know, Democrats would, would hang, hang together to, um, to confirm a Biden nominee because there's no longer a filibuster for Supreme Court uh, nomination. So, uh, you know, as a plausible matter, the, the seat could be filled. Um, do I think Justice Breyer should retire? I think that's his decision. Um, do you, here's another 
hypothetical question about the future of the court. So now imagine from Diego Soto that Breyer were to retire and that Biden is able to confirm his replacement given what you were just laying out. How do you think that this would change the dynamic of the court? Um, we would still presumably have only three liberal justices. Um, and uh, Diego Soto is wondering, I think, about whether uh, President Biden nominated another woman to the court. Um, could that change things in some way if all three of the liberals were women? No, I, I, um, I don't think so. I mean, every person is different. And um, presumably a replacement for Stephen Breyer would be younger by some decades. Um, but uh, the gender issue, it hadn't occurred to me that, you know, um, Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg were all very different individuals. And I don't kind of lump them under, you know, two X chromosomes on the court. No magic fairy dust to sprinkle. <laughs> Um, here is a different question from Eric Hirshhorn. Um, do you think that the goal of restricting abortion is more central to the justices on the right than the goal of restricting the right to vote? Um, yes, I guess I say yes. I think they have, um, I think they have religious motivations and I think these were people who were, um, who came of age imbued with the notion that there was something deeply illegitimate about Roe versus Wade and now find themselves in a position to do something about it. Um, you know, I think the chance to take a few whacks at the Voting Rights Act is, is, is nice for them, it's gravy, but it's not, um, it's not what they were raised on, if, if, if you will. Right, uh, and, and yet at the same time, it's not like they have to choose. <laughs> <laughs> they do not have to choose. They live in the world of both and, um, right. especially if you're not Chief Justice Roberts and the court isn't named after you and you're not thinking of the kind of institutional legitimacy problem all the time. Right. Um, so I would love some more um, questions to come in if people have more ideas. In the meantime, I wanted to ask you about the New York um, gun regulation, a case that was argued, I think now it's about a week and a half ago. Um, could you explain that case and then talk a little bit about what you learned from oral argument? So this is a case about uh, concealed carry of uh, uh, handguns. And uh, every state has some kind of gun licensing mechanism. Uh, New York and I think six other states have a, a rather strict um, a regime where it's not enough to show that you're a law-abiding citizen without a criminal record and so on. You have to show that you have a special need uh, for carrying a gun for self-defense, a need that distinguishes you from the general run of the rest of the population. So the claim is um, that this violates the Second Amendment as um, uh, first set out only uh, not too long ago in 2008 in the Heller decision where for the first time the court interpreted the Second Amendment to give an individual right to gun ownership. And since then, we haven't learned anything else about that right. So that as the court has received and rejected a number of Second Amendment challenges over the intervening years, <clears throat> Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, Justice Gorsuch have been whining that, you know, the Second Amendment has been reduced to a second class right. So, um, so their time has come. And I think it's um, quite likely that New York's law will be invalidated. Um, that will leave New York functionally with the law that most states have, but the the, the question is, um, now that that issue would be joined by the court instead of just kind of assumed in the wake of Heller, what, like all these cases that we've been discussing, what would come next? What's the limiting principle? And what, what, yeah, what's your limiting principle? What's your governing principle? And so, um, you know, concealed carry, open carry, different kinds of weapons, different places where one can bring weapons and all this would would lie ahead. And, you know, I think there was a little, during the argument, a little concern manifested about um, 
because Heller, th there was some limitation in Heller, which uh, we subsequently learn um, Justice Kennedy, who was the fifth vote, had insisted to Justice Scalia that you've got to put in some kind of limitations. And so, um, you know, the, the language in Heller was something like, um, we're not, we're, we're talking about a gun at home for self-defense. We're not talking about bringing a gun into a kind of place that historically had not permitted individual weapons. Well, I don't know what that means. So Justice Kagan was asking, well, how about the subway? You know, and how about um, a college campus and this, that, and the other thing. And, and so, you know, it may have set the majority back a little bit, because are they going to become, is the Supreme Court going to become the, the gun licensing agency for the country? Um, you know, they'll, they'll have to figure that out. But I, I, I certainly think um, they would not have taken this case unless they wanted to uh, expand our understanding of the Second Amendment. Um, this question is from Linda Lazarus and Andy Schwartzman. Do you think the new case about the Environmental Protection Agency is likely to result in a serious attack on the non-delegation doctrine? That's a doctrine that allows Congress to delegate its powers to administrative executive agencies to make regulations um, and thereby threaten the traditional regulatory regime of the post-New Deal era. Yeah, so this is a case, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I haven't gotten into the weeds of this case. And, and it's a strange case because it's a challenge to a regulation that actually is, is in the process of being replaced, as I understand it. So again, it's a case that, you know, they grabbed it because it was a vehicle. Um, is it a vehicle for reviving the non-delegation doctrine, which has only been invoked um, two times in the country's history uh, back in the 1930s? Um, the answer is, I don't know, but I just read the decision from the Fifth Circuit uh, that issued a stay of the Biden of the OSHA um, vaccine mandate that President Biden issued uh, earlier this month, and the uh, language from the third from the Fifth Circuit from the three judge panel of the Fifth Circuit talks about um, uh, nobody gave OSHA this power, and uh, uh, you know Congress didn't delegate this, this kind of public health power to OSHA. Whether that's true, I really don't know. But the suggestion was uh, this would be a chance to revive the non-delegation doctrine and get at the administrative state that seems to be so bothersome to um, a number of, of conservative judges on, on various courts. So it's certainly, it's on their screen. I'm not 100% sure that, um, there's a solid five votes for doing something quite that drastic in a in a case like this. Right. For one thing, we don't know where Justice Barrett stands on the non-delegation doctrine because um, the last case was before she showed up. Um, last question. So when you look back at the sweep of American history, there have been moments when the Supreme Court was clearly, I think, in retrospect, on the right side of history and the kind of Martin Luther King sense of the arc of history bending toward justice. And then there have been a number of moments in which the court was very much on the wrong side um, before the Civil War, after the Civil War, in upholding um, separate but equal, um, in the Korematsu decision, which allowed for uh, the internment of Japanese people during World War II. What is it reasonable to expect of the Supreme Court going forward? Um, I mean, do liberals tend to have a kind of inflated sense of what the court should really be doing um, based on an era that began in the 1960s where the court issued a number of liberal decisions? Would we be better off with a kind of shrunken role for the court? Or is that itself a sort of partisan sentiment that is now coming to fruition more in part because the court is taking this conservative turn? Yeah, it's a, it's a deep question. And I think what's come clear in the decades since the Warren Court ended, and it ended in, in, in 1969 with Chief Justice Warren's retirement and Richard Nixon's uh, inauguration, um, is that a kind of progressive era for the Supreme Court is a historic an anomaly in the whole span of American history. So uh, I think that's a hard piece for for progressives to swallow today who were 
uh, who came of age with that notion that that is the highest and best use of the third branch of government. Um, I think younger scholars of the court and younger constitutional law people have kind of gotten over that and they're, they've become quite cynical about the court. Uh, I think there's a kind of an interesting generational divide in, in how people who spend their days thinking about the Supreme Court are in fact thinking about it and its role. Um, so does it portend that, you know, we, we collectively uh, should, ex should not expect the court to save us? I, I think that's right. The court's not gonna save us. Um, we may have to save ourselves and, uh, and that's through politics, I think. Thank you. Well, great moderating, Emily. Uh, you know, it really makes a difference when the moderator knows the subject uh, also. Um, and uh, Linda, what a, what a timely and, and useful book. It, it helps us uh, all so much to, to get perspective on what has become of the court at this critical moment uh, after all the Trump appointments. Uh, and besides, the, the book's uh, wonderfully accessible and, and, and lively. Uh, to, to I everyone. read it in about a day and a half, I think. I sort of so, tore through it because it was so readable. Exactly. Um, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that uh, in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of Justice on the Brink. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well-read. <laughs>